Thank, Thank you all so much for coming. I hope that um, we're going to have a very magical night here. Um, this is going to be a little bit of an exploration into the, uh, the 17 M's of magic, mystery, music, madness, myth, mischief, and 11 others <laughs> that I can't think of right now. But they exist. This is um, a, kind of a celebration, um, on a triple fold celebration in a way, um, if I remember all three of them. Um, this week was a high holiday for those of us that follow interesting witchy paths um, called Imbolc, um, which is the time of the year when um, the, we're halfway basically through the winter. So everyone should be happy about that. And if you were living in a country that actually had seasons around this time of the year, I protest. The hue, the hues. Does anyone know what a hue is? Hues. You. It's yes. A you. It's, <laughs> you say it's I'm, I'm bringing back that Jersey accent. Use guys. Um, but in bulk means use milk. Um, it's the time of the year where, if you were living off the land, you would be thankful that your calves or your 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 set your your heifers and your ewes and your critters would start having milk right now. Has anyone noticed in the last three days that you actually started hearing the songbirds started coming out a little bit more? In ancient mythology, around this time of the year, the crone of winter, who represents the, you know, the um, the dark goddess aspect of the triple goddess, would literally, if you you know, if you could visualize it, would be kind of passing away with winter as the spring maiden, just being born, would walk past her, and um, so we're having a, a celebration to kind of celebrate in bulk. It's also, Imbolc is also a high holiday for people that are on a particular spiritual path, which I am on, um, which um, most of you guys probably have heard me say this before. It's not the most poetic sounding word, which is really funny about a lot of the really poetic, meaningful words in Irish history. They just kind of are hard and blunt like German words, but um, I'm on a path to become a bard. And one year ago um, today, I did a ritual out in the backyard, um, surrounded by the chickens, on um, in bulk, and I dedicated uh, myself to start this path of becoming a bard. And uh, typically, how it works is you would um, you would um, declare your intent to take a bardic chair, which in the official bardic institutions, there's only like one bard per city or something like that, but. I'm a little bit more of a rogue than that, and instead of declaring myself the Bard of San Diego, because then you're supposed to check and see if there's anyone that calls themselves that, and you're supposed to have a competition, but you know, the, bards, the Bards do that, and uh, mostly, mostly in Wales. Um, but I'm a little bit more of a rogue Bard, and I declared myself the Bard of the canyons, and of the street, and of the road, and of the critters, and of, and of the unsung heroes and heroines of the radical movements. The Bard is... Um, historically was um, that's that character that you see a lot in ancient myths of like the old haggard character with the big beard and the heart um, that's that's pretty much what the bard is the bard um, was considered to have like such tremendous magical powers with their verses and the the poetry that um, they were appointed high positions like the official bards got to sit like literally next to the king at the table and were given their heart from the kings when Christianity came through, um, the Druids, which the, the bards are part of the Druidic um, culture, which is the old pagan ritual um, priests and um, you know, seers and, and mystics um, from the, the Celtic countries, the Druids were pretty much either assimilated into, the, into Christianity. Um, some say that the, the Druids, as they were actually evolving into more of a patriarchal institution themselves, um, saw it as the fulfillment of their prophecy. And a lot of them just kind of like fought it and were killed or were wiped out. And when they say St. Patrick killed the snakes or chased the snakes out of Ireland, that's pretty much what they refer to. So all the all the bards pretty much went rogue. And then and that's when you would have like these wandering hobos basically showing, you know, coming through town with these harps and stuff. And like if you think of like the image of the wandering minstrel and the troubadours, those are all the descendants of the bards. And they had these magical powers. I'm gonna share with you a little story about, um, which I thought was significant. This is a great book called Irish Mythology by Lady Gregory, who um, 
in the 1800s um, in Ireland after it had been colonized for so long and it had kind of lost its original um, culture to some degree because it had been anglicized. Um, there was this great Celtic revival um, where poets like William Butler Yeats and Fiona MacLeod were starting to invoke um, the fairy mythologies of the past and bringing, bringing things back and there was a lot of revolutionary movements that were calling them, naming themselves after the old mythological characters from history and all of the ancient stories of um, Irish mythology were kind of very, you know, they were scattered and so she was one of the first person to collect it all together into an easy to read format that, that covers all the, all the bases and so I wanted to um, share with you a little bit um, from Lady Gregory, if I can find the part that I was looking for. Because we're also here tonight, it's supposed to be a benefit for the Remedy Garden, and I found um, this is really interesting passage. In Irish mythology, it all starts out with this, um, before the Celts arrived, there was this mythical race of mystic people of I don't know if they were really people called the Tuatha Dé Danann, which were the children of the tribe of Dana, Dan, or Danu, um, who was like a, a, a pan-Celtic um, primordial, you know, mother goddess um, that pretty much gave birth to all of them. And they came in on the first May Day, which was called Beltane back then. And that's a whole different story. I'm going to save that for May Day because that's like this huge, wonderfully mystic story. But there's this one battle that's happening where they have to um, fend off this group of um, monsters, monstrous people that are their bitter enemies called the Fomorians. And the Fomorians want to take Ireland from the Tuatha Dé Danann. And um, Nuada at the time is sort of the king of the, uh, the Tuatha. Um, and um, he loses his arm in a battle. And um, he's then, so he loses his kingship because of that. Um, and then this new guy named Bress takes over as king. And they actually all elect their kings at this time. Um, Bress is a real asshole. He's just like, he's not a cool guy. And um, he's half Fomorian. And um, he just doesn't treat anyone very good at all. And so here's. This is a little passage that kind of talks about the birth of the bards and the birth of herbalism from the Irish perspective. There came a day, at last, when a poet came to look for hospitality at the king's house, Corpore, son of Edon, poet of the Tuatha Dé Danann, and how it was he was treated. He was put in a little dark, narrow house where there was no fire or furniture or bed, and for a feast, three small cakes, and they dry, were bought to him on a little dish. When he rose up on the morrow, he was no way thankful, and as he was going across the green, it is what he said, without food ready on a dish, without milk enough for a calf to grow on, without shelter, without light in the darkness of night, without enough to pay a storyteller, may that be the prosperity of Bress. And from that day, there was no good luck with Bress. And it actually really all went downhill for him after that. And well, that's what it says here. But it was going down, he was forever after. And that was the first satire ever made in Ireland. In Irish mythological and magical speak, a satire is a very powerful word. Um, you didn't want to piss off the bards because they had this magic power to write a satire about you because they didn't have anything written back then. All the people knew in foreign lands about, you know, big warriors and characters were what the bards sang about them. So if you pissed off the bard, you'd go to another kingdom and start, like, spreading all these malicious rumors about you. And then they would also say that they would use this special um, aspect of the satire called the dark speech, which um, involves certain esoteric language tricks, but it could make boils grow on your face and your crops fail and all the things that witches were blamed for in later generations. And so, but that's like the first mention of bards. Um, and now as to Nuada, after his arm being struck off, he was in his sickness for a while. And then Deanne checked, the healer made an arm of silver for him with movement in every finger of it and put it on him. And from that point, he was called Nuada of the Silver Hand. Now, Miak, son of Dianchek, was a better hand at healing than his, fa than his father and had done many things. And Miak was not satisfied with what his father had done to the king. And he took Nuada's own hand that had been struck off and bought it to him. 
and set it in its place and said, Joint to joint and sinew to sinew, three days and three nights he was with the king. The first day he put the hand against his side, the second day against his breast till it was covered with skin, and the third day he put bulrushes that were blackened in the fire on it, and at the end of that time the king was healed. But Dianchek was vexed when he saw what his son had done a better cure than himself. And he threw his sword at his head and cut the flesh, but the lad healed the wound by means of his skill. Then Dianchek threw it a second time, and it reached the bone, and the lad was able to cure the wound. Then he struck him the third and fourth time till he cut out the brain, for he knew no physician could cure him after that blow. And Miak finally died, died, and he was buried. And herbs grew up from his grave to the number of the joints and sinews. In other words, they grew up from the grave. All the, all the medicinal herbs in the world grew up from Miak's grave in the position, like, like a body grew up with all the herbs laid out as to what use, you know, there are for all the information of all the of all the ancient medicine, and what you have here is the symbolism of even like this is like we're talking like three or four thousand years ago, even back in what we consider ancient times, they were struggling between preservation of the ancient wisdom and the new ways, and um, Dianchek could be seen as sort of like the new modern day surgeon doing like surg surgical procedures, you know, and like you know butchering people and like gimmickry and adding a silver hand and stuff, whereas his son was trying to preserve the old ways and was murdered for it. But Aramid, his sister, came and spread out her cloak and laid the herbs over it in the position where they would be meaningful so that she could preserve the information about how to use the medicines. Um, but Dianchek saw what she was doing and he came and mixed up the herbs. And to this day, no one knows all their right powers. And this is why it's so important after thousands and thousands and thousands of years that we're, we're here to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to support the good work of the Remedy Guard. And I think it's very important for me um, because this is also sort of a coming out once again for me to talk about um, the, the cross relationship between what we call mental health and um, you know, lunacy and how it kind of, for me, the, the, the different ways that you can, that that manifests and like how you can, the different um, ways that you can work um, to protect yourself, or not protect yourself, but to, I don't know, I don't have this all worked out, you guys. <laughs> but um, point being is that I got here in um, San Diego, most of you guys, none of you guys were here when I, remember when I first got here about seven years ago after I had spent all these years in Eugene and um, had gone through a, a pretty intense um, period of going through this huge Eugene anarchist uh, explosion of like manly fight 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 and destroy the state and smash things and like it kind of imploded and there was FBI stuff and like I ended up siding with the um, the gender queer feminist you know anti-civ element within within the larger group and um, I eventually just kind of ended up dropping out and what, what really kind of helped me was I, I, I've always had these moments in my life where, where uh, I don't know, I realized that um, doing drag was a great way um, to kind of like um, help out my, um, my mental health situation. I was getting really depressed. I was actually very suicidal at the time, and I invented this character, Electric Thunder Bunny. And this is what I was getting at the way that I've dealt with my, um, my mental health, is I have this way of kind of fragmenting um, personalities and such, and becoming, becoming new creatures. And um, I've always had this fascination with blurring the lines between things that people consider polarities. And so I'm not, I was never super interested in trying to be portrayed, you know, look like I'm actually a woman or something like that, but more just like this gender blur. And I'd be walking through Eugene with these friggin' big old crinoline skirts on and like, you know, my, my guns are out and shit. And, you know, I've got like makeup on and I'm like very, you know, like, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> and like, I would have to carry this big buck knife with me. And I got arrested once at a critical <laughs> mass and I had to go to jail like that. And, um, but, um, I moved here. And um, got the the coveted role after I was spending a couple years with these folks chasing around the Minutemen, 
Um, I guess what I'm getting at is that my interest has always been in collecting the stories and the significance of stories and being the storyteller. And that was the role that I eventually found myself settling in. And um, I was given this great opportunity after doing this work against the Minutemen, um, where we came up with this idea of doing the menage a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And I was encouraged to take a bunch of the songs that I had written about the Minutemen and put it together into the first punk rock opera, which we did at the Circle A Ranch. And I wore this very dress for it. And, you know, it was cool. And then we decided to do another one. The next year we wanted to focus on different things. And this is kind of where it gets interesting and um, where I found out that I'm not just depressed. You know, because I always thought, well, there's that side of me that's just like really depressed and suicidal sometimes. And then I'm just like the real me, which is like the, the crazy guy that's like working on all my creative stuff. But um, so I'm working on all these songs for this rock opera that's going to um, center around the deeper philosophical issues of like, um, you know, spiritualism and like kind of anti civilization mixed in with feminist, gender queer, and anti oppression against, you know, ageism and just like pulling it all together and stuff and I'm running around in the sun you guys remember I was like fucking baking my brain running around um, and all you know for, for like weeks I'm like I got like a little setup over here I'm building puppets you know and over here I'm fucking writing all my scribbling feverishly all my notes and my, my noodles baking I'm not drinking water I'm not eating food I'm just drinking coffee and smoking pot all day and I'm just like but the point is that like the shit's fucking coming to me I'm getting like the stories and the lines and the lyrics and like everything is just fucking coming to me because I'm realizing, you know, in retrospect, what was happening to me was what would be regarded as kind of like a shamanistic experience and like I'm doing all the methods at the same time. I'm already a little mad and I'm not drinking water, not eating food and I'm doing fucking drugs and stuff and like, and so point being is that I wrote this, this song that to me remains like my personal anthem. I know that was a really long lead up into the song, but you know, <laughs> the, whole, the whole point to all this stuff is that I'm telling stories, right? <laughs> I don't have it all worked out. But this, this, this is a song that made me fucking go crazy. And I went to, I, I literally went to the other world to get this song. And I'm not saying that it's like the most amazing song in the world, but to me it's, it's incredibly meaningful. And it really does encapsulate my my, my deep uh, political views on the world. And this is called Antisocial Butterfly Conspiracy. Rich loves this song. <laughs> He's just like, what the fuck are you talking about? These freaking angry possums running around blowing up hummers and like, the owls. And like, that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> All right.
eventually we'll be used to be museums of how fucked up things used to be in the days before the antisocial butterfly conspiracy. Officially on the path yes. of, uh, of magic, for years and years and years I had already been calling forth, really with uh, working with fairy energy. I know it sounds really silly when people talk about the fairies, but from the Irish mythological perspective, the two authors they name these mystical creatures that lived in Ireland before the Celts arrived, they're the ones that eventually, over the course of thousands and thousands of years, were dim diminutized into the little fairies that we see. Um, and this has a lot to do with the power of story and the way stories are changed throughout the years and the strength of stories and like over the, over the course of you know decades and centuries, how cultures shift based on how the stories are told. And if you doubt the significance that the power of stories have, just consider this wonderful great nation of ours and the wonderful myths that is built upon the stories of like, you know, the pilgrims and Christopher Columbus and like, you know, Thanksgiving and like all these horrible things that when we dissect the real truth, we know that they're horrible and they're not worth celebrating yet people change them over the years. And like the, like the Tea Party, the way they like to emanate this whole revolutionary war era as though like that was like a pinnacle of freedom, but it was only a pinnacle of freedom if you were a white Anglo-Saxon property owner that had slaves. You didn't have any any rights other than that. Howdy! Hey. Come on in. Ah. There's a uh, chair over there. And, yeah. So last year, so this was my, uh, my year and a day. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened back when I, after I wrote that song, we had a performance. Um, and I thought I thought I went well, but I was so high in mania. I was like, whoa! Like I had flown up to the sun. You know what I mean? I had never gotten that fucking. I didn't even know that I had gone bonkers. And what happened was, a couple people had kind of called me on my behavior because I was like, in my in my own world, nobody knew what was going on with me. And a conversation happened, and like, basically the balloon got popped, and like. My brain just couldn't handle it, and, and like, I just felt like this, this weird sudden shift that I just couldn't explain. I went to work that day, and I remember everything was just strange, and I'm coming down the hill towards the Circle A Ranch, everything's just strange, and I see this owl fly by, and I just like stood in awe, and I felt like this even more deep sudden shift thing that happened. And I just didn't know what the fuck I was experiencing. And I went home, went to sleep. Next day I woke up, I'm hanging around the Circle A Ranch. It's a hot summer, you know, spring day. And um, I think mo mo most, most of you guys were all gone. Val was around. You saw me. You were like meditating, huh? I was sitting, sitting in the garden, completely out of my mind. I didn't know what the fuck had happened to me. I didn't really know, you know, what was going on. Everything was... It, you, I felt like I had taken like 40 hits of acid or something, minus the buzz. Just complete confusion. Butterflies and dragonflies are flying around. I'm seeing these flickers. Everything's like little fairies. And I'm just like confused the fuck out of my mind. And like I built this little, uh, in the fire pit, I took a bunch of bricks and I built an effigy out of bricks that I guess was of myself. And I gave myself boobs and a wiener. And um, I just kind of sat there staring at it, and then I think, uh, Val, you don't mind if I pull you into the story? That's all right. So I'm just completely out of my head. Val, Val comes over, and um, we had had a little tension, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, that had led into whatever. So, and so Val kind of goes into the house, and she's kind of doing her own thing, and I'm sitting out there, and I'll be honest, I was, I was thinking about just killing myself. And I like to, I, I want to talk about these things because I think it's important for us to 
um, to visibilize mental health and the, and the struggles that we have to go through because I didn't know what was fucking happening. I thought my world was over and I had contemplated killing myself. And I was like, well, maybe I can just talk the battle. Kill myself or talk the battle. And so I remember it being very awkward. I was just kind of sitting there and she's sort of ignoring, not ignoring me, but we had had tension. So you're, you're a little cold. And um, I go in and I make some ramen noodles or something like that. And I plop this weird plate of ramen noodles and I can't even eat it. And I'm just like sitting there playing with it. And I'm just like, oh, what the fuck's going on? And then I decide I'm going to go take a shower. I just need a shower really bad. And I take this shower and like I scrub my body like it's like the, the end of the world. And then like while I'm still naked, I get this urge to clean the entire bathroom with bleach. And so I'm like kneeling on the floor in the bathtub and I'm like scrubbing the entire bathtub with bleach, getting it all over my body. And I'm like, oh yeah, I was going to talk to Val. I put on some clothes. And, you know, <laughs> and I was like, Val, there's some shit going on. And like, you know, luckily that Val was there for me. And um, I spent the next two months kind of um, in this in-between space. Um, but it was kind of funny because I was still somewhat functional I, and I was able to go to work and um, you would have been there during this period where I was hearing monsters in the refrigerator at work and I was afraid to make smoothies um, because there was, I, heard, I, I heard all this knocking in the fridge and I was like, how do I ask my coworkers if they can like open the fridge and let me know if there's monsters in there? And so, so I was basically like hallucinating for two months, you know, and it took, thank you. I was like, do you hear that? And that made me feel so much better. <laughs> I was just like, but I, honestly, what you know, if I'm just lucky that I had people like you know you guys, because if I was like regular Joe, just kind of holding down a job that was you know in an apartment by myself, I would have been done. I would have been out on the street, and I would have gotten shot by the cops because I was completely out of my mind. But you guys took care of me. Um, and so what ended up happening is because I have this tendency to kind of turn everything into mythologies, into stories and tales, and live through, live through them, which is what I've always done, was I began to kind of see my situation as sort of like this fragment and fragmentation of my identity, and I was battling between Hollow Man, who was kind of like the, the male gender, tough, quiet guy that doesn't talk about his feelings, that's in control of the body, and the Cuckoo, which is kind of like a combination of like my wounded little boy and also you know, the, the electric thunder bunny, the, 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 out and, the out and crazy, you know, fun-loving cross-dresser, you know, and at the same time I had all these, I had always kind of thought of my depression and my anxiety as all these demons that were living in my head, and so what ended up happening was I ended up having to have a conversation and negotiate a deal between the three parties, and I would have been sitting there in the carport, but I was there for part of it, and I'm negotiating the truce between Hollow Man, the cuckoo, and the bats about how we're going to settle ownership over me. And of course I had this, I insisted everybody just call me Steven at that point, because I had too many names, I'm like fucking Steven and Kooky, fucking, the Minutemen called me Spike, and the Electric like, Thunder Bunny, and like, now I'm like Woody Nightshade, and like I've got another idea that I'm thinking of. <laughs> but anyway, I had to negotiate between all the parties, and part of, part of, you know, so basically it was kind of like, um, you know, like when parents get divorced and like they have to kind of set up, like, what's that called when you split custody? So I had to split custody of my body between Hollow and the Cuckoo, which really just kind of amounts to just kind of like the, the seasonal cycles of depression and making sure that in the springtime or something like that, that maybe I'm enjoying myself and being able to explore my creativity. But then there was the bats which was kind of like the, the wild card in the situation. And I thought it was a positive thing for me was that I turned these demons in my head, which haunted me from my Catholic upbringing, into something different that was wild creatures. And I equate lunacy with wildness. And the way I see madness and lunacy now is that it's, it's, it's the clash of your wild spirit not fitting into a world that you don't fit into in civilization. And throughout history, people that have had these experiences were, were revered, they were the shamans in all indigenous cultures. It was the crazy people that could walk between the worlds. And we were the ones that brought the first stories out of the other worlds. And the first stories were just 
Cool. Um, so, I started writing these songs while I was coming down from this crazy trip to kind of commemorate the hollow man and the cuckoo and the bats. And I started writing these two, these two songs, um, but I didn't get very far with them. I got like the first couple parts and they got finished this year, a year like um, after I had proclaimed my bardic intentions and started to like tune in and to be, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this, the third significance of Imbolc is that the patron goddess of, music, of bards and poets is um, the goddess Breed, who's a triple goddess. She's the spring maiden and she's also the mother in cer certain aspects. But she's a, a triple goddess that relates to all aspects of fire, specifically poetry, herb, um, healing, and herbalism, um, well, music with poetry, and storytelling, and all the bardic arts, and also blacksmithing, which this day translates as kind of like creating things, you know, with fire to some degree. And so she's she's the patron saint or the patron goddess or whatever, patron muse for the bards, among other people. And in bulk is a very high holiday for a bard and to have actually proclaimed my intention to become a bard on Imbolc was like a very magical thing. So anyway, point being was after all this, I spent last summer after going on a wonderful road trip about up to Oregon and having, for me, a pretty cool um, summer that kind of freed me up. I came back all energized and my mania came back and I learned how to deal with my mania and not to fucking, you know, let myself go too far, but to still dip in and, and allow the muse to give me the stories. Um, and so I managed to finish these two stories, and I'm going to play one for you right now, called Cerebral Hurricane. And this is kind of about turning, turning my experience with going crazy into a fairy tale, which is really what all the ancient fairy tales were. They were, they were shamanic um, stories of going to the other world, and over the course of years, they were kind of stripped of their esoteric meaning. By the time the Germans got a hold of them, they were just, you know, the the poor maiden in the woods getting poisoned by the, by the grandmother, you know, and the wicked stepmother, and so the, you could see the, 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 the complete stripping of femininity from divinity as the alpha god kind of took over, but I uh, digress. Uh, cerebral hurricane. I'm going to use my capo. Only because it looks cool to have it there. It makes me look like I know how to play my guitar better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because um, there's this one chord that I'm going to be playing and I don't have to hold that string down when I play it. <laughs>
you're going to be testing on that. <laughs> There's a certain breed of character that shows up often in most mythological cycles called the wild man of the woods. Uh, which kind of goes along with what I was talking about of the, the mad people really being, um, you know, the shamans, I guess you would say, in indigenous cultures. Um, and the wildness is, or the, the, the madness is the same as wildness. Um, and there, there's, a, there's all these characters that exist, like I said, in mythological cycles of these madmen out in the woods. Ted Kaczynski, the unit of armor, would be, okay, that was supposed to be fun. <laughs> more modern incarnation, but it's true though. But let me give you some examples. Um, in Celtic myth, there was this fellow by the name of Sweeney. Um, and there's this great story called The Madness of Sweeney um, that exists. It takes place around the 600s, 200 years after Christianity had swept through Ireland. He was the last pagan king of Ireland. His name was Sweeney. The story is called The Frenzy of Sweeney. Sweeney one day is just kind of kicking it, hanging out in his little castle or something, counting his cows. And he hears this annoying bell clanging that's going on out there somewhere in the woods. And he decides to go out and, you know, and investigate. And he's super mad about it. And he goes rushing out there. And he's a big hairy guy. And his wife tries to grab him from going out there. And she pulls his cloak off. And he runs out there completely naked. And he finds this bishop, a Christian bishop named Ronan, who's laying down the cornerstones for a new church that he's going to build in the woods of the last pagan king of Ireland, Sweeney. And Sweeney says... What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and he fucking, he takes, he smashes the work that, that Ronan is doing, takes this guy's Bible, and throws it into the water. And back then, even the, even the Christian priests had magical powers too. And this guy ends up cursing Sweeney to spend the rest of his days as a madman. And right, right at that moment, though, um, Sweeney gets um, called off to go fight in a big battle, you know, that that was going on, the High King had called for, for, for support, and so he, he ends up going out to the battle. The curse hasn't come into effect yet. He sees at, at, the, at the battle site where all the armies are gathering um, to engage in this battle to protect Ireland from out, outside invaders, he sees the priest again, and the priest has the audacity to sprinkle holy water on him. And of course, Sweeney doesn't know what the fuck is going on. He thinks he's just being mocked or something like that, and he gets mad, and he throws a spear tries to kill the bishop, it hits the guy's bell, bounces off, and at that point, the spell goes into effect. So even back then, priests, despite their, their obvious adversity to people engaging in magic craft, they're engaging in it themselves. Um, so what ends up happening is Sweeney spends seven years flying like a bird, this big hairy guy jumping from branch to branch, lost in the woods with his madness, learning about the herbs, and um, writing verse for seven years. He eventually gets kind of talked down by some, some, no, some nobility that recognize him. They take this madman out of the woods and they bring him back. And just when you think, okay, Sweeney's going to be sane again, and I'm going to talk about what sane means, he runs into a mill hag who's a representation in mythological cycles of the dark goddess. And she kind of taunts him a little bit says, hey, can, you can't jump onto that tree. She tricks him into starting to do it again, and he fucking loses his mind again and spends his eternity lost in the woods, which is really an anecdote for remaining in touch with the Earth gods. Merlin, you guys know Merlin, right, from the Arthurian cycles. Before Merlin was a big wizard, hi, Rachel. Uh, before Merlin was a big wizard, he was a warrior that fought in the army of some, some king in the, in the ancient Welsh um, Bardic stories before before the Brits kind of took over and stole King Arthur and Merlin as like their thing, um, but Merlin one day after a battle he sees his lord get killed and he goes mad and spends um, I think a year lost in the woods rambling to himself writing verses learning about the herbs from the earth itself with his only companion a pig who's another who is a who is, who's symbolic of the dark goddess and it's another world creature, but he spends up, he ends up like learning all this stuff from this little pig. Um, and so once again, these are, these are all, they're just stories that you can appreciate on just sort of like a, a story level, but the, the deeper esoteric meanings of them 
um, are there for the enjoyment as well. And, and I do think that Ted Kaczynski is kind of like a modern day Sweeney. <laughs> So there's part two of that song, where we bring in the new character, the cuckoo, because we didn't even talk about the cuckoo in the last song. So this is kind of uh, about how the cuckoo, uh, the first song, as you can see, kind of like was, was all about sort of leading up to the crash of like, it's, it's mostly about the mania and like the depression and like how I was kind of like dealing with like hiding my hiding my pain and my bats and wouldn't let anyone see them wouldn't let anyone know what was going on and then i went fucking and like it all exploded because the drain got clogged and like it exploded so now cuckoo emerges and this one you can tell that i i finished writing recently because it has actual elements of um of magic in it, or not magic, but of Celtic spirituality and um, use of the, the three colors of the goddess, which is red, white, and black. White meaning the, uh, the maiden phase of life. Red, you know, in innocence, and, at least in this song. And um, red for the mother, um, for nurturance, and black for destruction. So you'll catch those references. Is this just weird? <laughs> okay. Life is weird too. You know. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Thanks. All right. We were we were just discussing madness and how I, how I went mad and I wrote a song about it. guys have this tuner, it's like a video game, so when you hit the right note, all these lights go <laughs> and It's like you're, you're rewarded for tuning your guitar properly. <laughs> Cookie's Madness Part 2, Cuckoo Coup d'etat, which is a, a sly um, take on the menage coup d'etat. What was that called? The menage, coup d'etat. menage a coup d'etat, which was this <laughs> series of rock operas that I was doing that made me fucking go bonkers I'm trying to trying to write that shit. Um. <laughs>
No, but you know what? When I, I remember when I was little in that space and I was a little bonkers, one of the first things that I wrote was a two chord progression that was very soothing to me. And I don't know if you guys remember, there was a little blue chair that we had amongst the 30 blue chairs that were all, all the same, and one of them, someone had written in Sharpie on the back, pirate seating only, do not remove free chair. And I thought that was a special message that the world had given to me. And I thought it was like this ingenious, like, statement of some sort, you remember that. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote, I wrote a little song that just says that over and over, but then I actually wrote another one that involved Val, using the same tune, talking about how she was going to help me and take me to get some help. But I don't remember how it goes because I was completely bummed. There's your backup moment. Hey. <laughs> what you trying to do to me? <laughs> speaks the language of the Minotaur. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. All right, the fairies, and I mentioned this before, these, these wonderful mythical beings um, were over the course of years, thousands of years really, were reduced to just, um, well, in, in the um, English sense because of Shakespeare mainly and uh, this guy, Jake Jacoby, Jacoby, this artist who started painting little glittering creatures with gossamer wings. But before that, in, in the Irish tradition, they don't look like that at all. And up until this day, in the peasant areas of Ireland where they still speak Gaelic, the faith in fairies is still very strong. And it's kind of like the UFO stories or the ghost stories that we have here. People still have stories where they've run into fairies. And sometimes they're the chloricons, who are sort of like related to the leprechauns. And, um, they have a, a, a hearty appetite for booze, and if you get caught up with a chloricon, they'll they'll take you to some like castle somewhere, and you'll sneak into some like big wine cellar or whiskey cellar and drink all the booze, and then you'll pass out. And when you wake up in the morning, you're the only one that's there, and you're the one that gets busted. Or the puka is this giant like fairy horse that will somehow get enchanted to have to clean your house for you all the time, and you'll just be like, "Whoa, there's that fucking big white horse that's cleaning our." house again cool and like as soon as you give it now it'll keep doing it every day until you acknowledge that it's doing something good for you and thank it and it says thank you you freed me from my enchantment I can go now uh, the, 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 the maiden aspect breed this wonderful goddess that was like this pan Celtic um, goddess who by the way Britain Brittany bride brigade all these words come from this, this wonderful, you know, entity. Um, she was reduced to this uh, fairy called the Leannan She, and um, she is a word that uh, is the Irish word for fairy now. Um, that's like the actual Irish word. Um, but the Leannan She is kind of like a, this fairy creature that exists throughout most mythological, you know, cultures who gives the artists and the, and the musicians their bardic, you know, their, their inspiration. Um, She's, she's like the muse, but she kind of morphed over the years with Christianity into becoming the succubus that would drain you of your energy. And um, in, these, in, in a lot of the 18th century stories, this Leanne and she, would, uh, the, the poet would fall in love with them because they would get all their poetry from them, but it would, it would suck them dry and drive them into madness. But, and the, the dark goddess, the, 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 the crone figure, was kind of reduced into a way that's actually still kind of interesting and cool. You guys have heard of the Banshee? Who's ever heard, oh, the Banshee swam? Banshee means fairy woman. That's all that it means. And um, there, there are these old crone figures that are attached to certain old families in Ireland. And whenever someone of these old families dies, 
the people will hear the banshees howl for them and sometimes you might run into the banshees down by the river and if you were say in an army and you're on your way to a battle and you saw an old crone figure at a river washing your armor you would not go to battle because that that, that would mean that you were going to die So here's a wonderful song that I wrote last year. I really love this one. This is called Fairy Hobo Bard. Um, and it's, it sounds kind of silly, but it kind of gets into kind of like the, some of the, um, the, uh, the purposes of like what a bard does um, in terms of um, the types of magic that a bard can supposedly do, which is number one, to do songs that lift people. And that's, that should be an ideal thing that any musician can do to kind of write verses of flattery is what it was called and that's what the ancient bards had to do is write verses of flattery for you know for the kings and stuff um, the second thing is to write satires with dark spells that would that could ruin someone's life and the third thing was to use their shamanic powers to actually go into the other world and do um, soul retrievals which is to go and gather up the fragments of a person's lost soul and that's what a shaman does um, and that's what a bard is supposed to be able to do with the right, with the right powers and the right training. And so this song kind of, it's about sort of, because I wrote this song last year when, when we were kind of really getting into the, um, into the wobblies here and the free speech stuff that is being commemorated right now. And I was really getting a lot into the hobo trip and I wanted to combine that with my mystical path. Because a lot of hobo uh, folklore is actually really kind of interrelated a lot with um, esoteric um, ideas. Big Rock Candy Mountain. You guys know that song? It's like the quintessential like, little song. It's a, it's, a, it's a shamanic trip. And it, it goes back to about 800 years. Harry McClintock did not, he wrote, he wrote that version of it, but the, the, the story goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The original versions were this wandering bard ending up in like this mystical city where everything is made of sausages and meat and stuff, <laughs> which back then would be candy. You know, you have that kind of stuff. <laughs> Interesting fact and trivia is uh, something stupid that the Christians did during the plague <laughs> was was um, when uh, they were superstitious against black cats, which is a symbol of witches to some degree, as well as the IWW, and they picked that to strike fear and to evoke this image of like superstition. But so they started killing all the cats because they're associated with witches, which basically is what allowed the rats to bring the plague in and devastate Europe. Oh, shit. So, duh! Don't kill the fucking cats. <laughs> <laughs>
more official song for this set, and I'd like to bring my friends up from um, this wonderful band that's going to be playing next, um, Sasha and John Park from Muhammad Chang. And we're going to do this one song together. I'm not even going to play the guitar because I wrote this song over the. over the course of uh, this winter. Now, nearly every winter I experience, well, in October actually, I experience such a severe depression between my birthday, which is mid-October till Halloween, that I can get almost, I can get pretty suicidal. I just kind of keep to myself. That's why I never want to have a birthday party. And I just kind of usually don't celebrate Halloween. It wasn't always like that when I was a kid, but very terribly depressed. This year though, I decided that, well shit, fuck that shit. <laughs> because there's also the dark goddess. And I had been spending a lot of time, I began to notice the crows again. I'd always been fascinated with crows when I was a kid. And um, this summer me and Val had this funny experience that totally reawakened me like the crows had invited me back in. We were up in Portland and I was sitting out playing my, trying to work out my fairy hobo bard song on my guitar playing, you know, sitting on the hood of my car, drinking my coffee, having my cigarettes like I always do. And these, these just as Val's coming out, there's these crows sitting on the line above me, and they're laughing at me, right? <laughs> they totally were. They're fucking having this conversation with each other, and they're totally laughing. They're telling jokes about me, or something like that. And then all of a sudden, plop. No. They shit on my hood, and they started laughing. <laughs> they were just laughing. And like, I didn't get upset about it. I thought it was the funniest thing in the fucking world. And from that point on, I had, I had started getting really super into the crows again. And so what happened for me was this summer, I started hanging out um, and noticing the crows again. And I started to really go into like this trance-like state while I was working on, on songs and hanging out there in the morning and I started noticing the crows everywhere and I started working on this this song just kind of came to me about the dark goddess and I ended up getting a book um, about the Morrigan who's like the ultimate like there's a lot of different dark um, crone figures in Irish mythology and in the, in the, the Welsh version it's the Caridwen who's actually the, the poetic muse and in the cauldron of the Caridwen is where you get your, your initiatory um, your initiation into the bardic um, mysteries and stuff. But the Morrigan is kind of, she's associated with the crow, she's a triple goddess herself, which is this crazy mystery that, which is what makes it makes it so wonderful because sometimes she's Bave, Maka, and the Morrigan, and, and the Morrigu, and the Morrigan, and together the, the Morrigu, or something like that. Sometimes she's just three different crones, sometimes she's Naman, sometimes she's Anu, and so there's just like all this wonderful, you know, on lack of clarity about it, but she plays a very significant role in all of the legends of, you know, in, in the, she was part of the two authors of name. She was the battle crow. When she would fly over the battles, she would she would have this power to make the enemies automatically flee in terror and give power and confidence, you know, to her side. She was also a fertility goddess to a degree, and every Halloween where Halloween came from, what we're celebrating is the union of the Morrigan with the Dagda, who's the good god of um, Irish mythology. He's, he's the, the male figure that I tend to relate to the most. Um, I, meant, I meant to mention him before, um, but the Dagda is kind of, he's the father of the breed. We don't really know who her mother is, um, but that's the whole point is like, you have to look at these, these mythologies as cyclical, because sometimes the Dagda is the children is the, is the son of breed, and sometimes he's the father. And don't let that confuse you. We're talking about the cycles of life over and over again, and these mythical figures give birth to each other and become, like the maiden gives birth to the mother, the mother gives birth to the crone. You can look at it that way, or you can look at it literally as well. It's just, it's mysteries, but Halloween is when the Dagda and the Morrigan got together and, um, well, pretty much straddled over a giant river. And they do that every Halloween. That's what Samhain is. It's a, uh, it's the death of the year in the beginning. Um, for the Celts and the Druids, um, everything came from the primordial darkness. Darkness is the beginning of everything. And so anyway, point being was that 
I started to accept the dark time of the year and the darkness and all that, even though I always kind of, oh yeah, I'm into the dark. But like, yeah, I was like fucking really depressed, you know, the dark time of the year. And I realized that my, I was experiencing a spiritual death that kind of coincides with the death of the year. At least you can look at it that way. And I began to look at it that way. And I got this book and I started reading more about the Morgan. And I, I, I began to kind of learn to appreciate the, the beauty of, you know, of the dark goddess and of the death of the year. And you know what? I wasn't fucking depressed. I got through my, my birthday and Halloween and I just spent, you know, I kind of forced myself to be slightly manic in a way, which isn't the healthiest way either because, you know, I'm kind of more aloof and invasive and irresponsible or something like that, you know. But it's better than fucking, I want to die. <laughs> it's my birthday. I fucking hate myself. <laughs> I just fucking want to die. I'm gonna eat. So I spent. I'm waiting for these guys. Uh, I spent. I spent the winter, literally, like I said, uh, working on this one song, and, and it was written in the key of F sharp. Does anyone know the significance of the key of F sharp? Like the church, no? Wait, who said it? The church banned it. It's very, it's a very ominous tone or something like that. It's very prominent in heavy metal. Dangerous. Uh, uh, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> a lot of his songs are this F sharp minor. Well, it's tritone. Oh yeah, the devil's chord. Yeah, because it's a tritone of C. Yeah. So, so you're, you're literally banned for playing songs in the key of that sharp, and especially playing the, the fucking the devil's There's only like three intervals or something that you were allowed to play for a time. Yeah. yeah. So this is this song. I hope uh, people aren't terribly uncomfortable with this, but this is almost an, an invocation of the dark goddess that we're going to do um, for this song. So um, we're going to, it's a, it's more of a, a poem than a song set to, set to a rhythmic beat. Um, and we're going to, somewhere in the middle of it, and it tells the story of the dominionization of the dark goddess and the maiden figures throughout history through the experience, you know, it's, it's the story of, of the dark mother who's, who's the, the darkness before the light and she gives birth to everything and you know, her drum is, is the rhythm you know, her, her, her belly is the rhythm of life and she gives birth to the to the maiden she also has a son who um, helps to spread the seeds which is what males were seed bearers sorry uh, fertility creatures um, but anyway over, over, over the course do you guys know the origin of, of, nobil of kings and queens? You know, we have this, you'll notice that I refer a lot to kings and queens in my, in my songs, and I want to kind of clear it up that it's not like about what we consider nobility. The origins of kings and queens is that in the old, 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 old ancient days, what a queen meant was that it was the high priestess who was in direct contact um, in matriarchal times, or mat matrilinear times, I guess you would say, who was the high priestess who was most likely the shaman and most likely the crazy of the bunch who, have, who would come back with the stories and explain creation and throughout years. So she would be the high priestess and that's what literally a queen meant. A king was someone who was given um, sovereignty through her and was subservient to some degree to her and would either, because actually the, the Celts did practice human sacrifice um, in, their, in their ancient eras, the king would sometimes be symbolically killed. But he would be like the, the strongest warrior in the bunch or the best poet or something like that. But basically the crazy high priestess would pick who was going to be the king. And the king was subservient. Well, not really subservient, but like she had the power and she represented the land. And to be king all the way up through most, you know, mythological literature, the, um, you know, you hear a lot about, um, you know, the, the sovereignty goddesses. And that comes up a lot in the story of, I forgot to tell that story before, so, so never mind. <laughs> but, a, but a king was basically the seed bearer, and that's what he represents in the mythological cycles. And what we see through the years is the progression of patriarchal culture 
and the solar king who refused to die eventually. And it's before Christianity. You can't, you can't blame it all on the Christians. The Romans and the Greeks did it. Um, before Zeus was the big Greek, you know, fucking big alpha male. Chaos, the word chaos itself, primordial chaos, was the mother of the entire universe. She gave birth to the universe and to Gaia, who is the earth goddess. And later on, when patriarchy started to sweep through Greece, they came up with this new guy, Zeus, and then they had this clash of the titans. You guys have heard that phrase before, the clash of the titans. The titans were the old primordial goddesses and gods, and they had to slay them all to make way for the solar king. And Christianity really just kind of perfected it, is all that really happened, because this, this had made its way over to the Romans, who had stolen Christianity, who had, you know, who had stolen their who had stolen their religion from the Jews, and the, and the you know, Romans finally stole it, but honestly what they were worshipping was a Syrian sun god called Mitras, which was really popular with the Roman soldiers at the time. So, you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm all over this. I really need to practice all these things. <laughs> you know, that that's kind of a... I just kind of pull this shit out of my fucking... Thank you. 
as the Sun King siphons power. A god of the wrath, all in his path, by flames he will devour. Her temples desecrated, they mine the marrow from her bones. Her blood is spilt with diamond chills, but they cannot kill the crow. down at your hands and find that the lines and shape have become less distinct, slowly changing into silky black wings. You feel the rest of your body shrinking, changing bit by bit into the body of a raven. You test your new wings with a few hesitant flaps, then launch into the sky. Below, you can see gently rolling hills and lush rivers covering the land. As you are taking in the scenery, something catches your eye, and you circle downward to investigate and land on a bare tree branch. Smoke rises from the small valley, and you watch as men and women are fighting in a giant battle. As you watch them, you realize the sunlight reflecting off the warrior's swords was what caught your eye from above. One of the warriors falls, and after a few moments you see a strange silver mist forming over the body. You watch as the crystalline mist forms into a translucent version of the lifeless warrior on the ground. And you know this is the warrior spirit. Reverting back into the silver mist, the spirit warrior rises above the battlefield. Quickly you take flight, following alongside the spirit and making spiraling circles around you. The light that pulses from within the mist fascinates you. You feel compelled to follow it. You rise higher and higher until the world seems to shift and change. It was midday just a moment ago. But now the sky has changed to the muted gray of twilight And you can't tell if it's dawn or dusk Below the battlefield is gone You fly with the spirit until you notice a large mound below you The spirit sees the mound too and begins to descend Once on the ground the warrior returns to his or her human shape And you land on the spirit's shoulder which is surprisingly solid and warm The warrior approaches the mounds base, and you notice the mount has a doorway carved into its side that is lined with large stones carved with intricate spirals. The warrior passes the stone threshold, and you are in a long, dimly lit tunnel. The warrior continues deeper into the fairy mount, and it seems like a very long time before the tun tunnel widens and you enter a large, hallowed hall at the very heart of the hill. You hear the sound of boiling water before you see the large black cauldron in the center of the hall. An old woman stands just behind it, whispering to the churning waters. The crone sees you both and motions for the warrior to approach. The woman, although old and bent, has a kindly face, and when she smiles at you, you feel completely at ease in her presence, and you know somehow she is Babe of the Morrigan. Death is only a beginning. You have made this journey many times before and will make it again. If you wish, you may wait here in the other world and rest for a time. Or you may return immediately to the earthly plane. The choice is yours. The spirit considers for a moment, then decides to return. Babe nods and turns her attention back to the cauldron, her outstretched hands making a circling motion over the waters. As she does this, the liquid begins to swirl like a tiny whirlpool, reminding you of the spirals carved into the mound's entrance. Smiling, the warrior turns to you and thanks you for escorting her to the journey. Babe extends her hand, and you flutter across to her as the spirit enters the cauldron. The foreign warrior glows brightly for a moment, then vanishes. Babe points to the now still waters. In the reflective surface, you see a woman in labor. At the midwife's urging, she gives a final push and a tiny baby enters the world. As the midwife presents the child to the mother, you recognize the warrior's soul in the newborn's baby. Remember, little one, Babe says to you, nothing in the universe remains stagnant. Everything is constantly changing, moving around the wheel of life. Without death, there can be no rebirth. I am the death blow and the midwife of the soul. It is to you, it is, it is, it is to I you will come at this life's end, and it is through me that you shall be reborn. The figure of the woman in the mound begin to fade, and you feel your wings change back to fingers and arms. Slowly, you change back into yourself. As the scene fades to black, you find yourself back in your human body. Into 
and her own womb asleep under a spell. Now the walls are disappearing, but the moon still hears their howls. And where once stood the wild woods, our spirit bears an owls. And the crows are multiplying and adapting to survive. And it's through their eyes, grandmother spies, napping but alive. And a phantom lurks in shadows, whispering, remember me. Through song and dance and sacred plants, ancestral memories. Embedded in our consciousness are seven shadow streams. Black wings we sail through piercing thou Wake up in her dreams I sing this song of three old crows To that darkness in the box A magic key, so mote it be To rip open those locks Let slip the mighty hags of war Tear up the cobblestones The earth she quakes, our lady wakes She's rattling her bones and the crows are congregating, giant murder in the sky. A mantle falls, a shadow crawls. Mommy's come to say goodbye. It's high noon and the sky is black and the sun's under eclipse. Out of Hades comes our lady of the apocalypse and the fury. Fades and gorgons spiral backwards round the sun. A little spark flies through the dark. The king is on the run. You naughty boy, she whispers. Thunder clouds surround the sun. The solar king is trembling. The cooling has begun. Oh, Granny laughs. My boy, you're just a minor deity. You played the fool. You cannot rule with stolen sovereignty And lovingly she smiles so sweet Says sit on mommy's lap My little son, bad things you've done I think you need a nap Perched upon her cauldron He said one song before I die She takes the breath Exhales cool death The final lullaby The winter hat tends to Bubbling. A maiden new, a brother too, and the bards will sing our spring. Now our story is completed, and the new tale has begun. How does it go? Just ask the crow that's basking in the sun.